not everything is always better decentralized. Functions of an exchange can be better in a decentralized format, but to say everything is completely decentralized, I think that's a, far, a fairly far away future. Swissborg. 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 Swissborg is sorti ce matin. They have an app where you can buy crypto. They connect to Binance, HitBTC, LMAX, and Kraken and find the best rates in the market. What I like about Swissborg is that they have an amazing app that can directly buy cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and also cash out as well. Through Swissborg, all assets will have a fiat gateway. And here is the thing. Premium features gives you zero fee trading. That is zero fees. If you want to buy Bitcoin with fiat, I suggest you buy through Swissborg rather than Coinbase. And if you're interested in trading the likes of Ethereum or Bitcoin, use Swissborg's application. Dear crypto community, blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind blowing guest. Joseph Weinberg, co-founder at Shift Network, a crypto OG, a Bitcoin OG, and someone who's been helping the space move forward with tons of cool topics such as NFTs, digital identity, compliance, and a lot of other things that you guys will be spoiled today. And a big shout out to Crypto Slate for always supporting us and writing awesome articles about all these interviews. We really appreciate your hard work. So without further ado, Joseph, thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you doing today? I'm great, Alex. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you too. And obviously it's for someone who's been in this space for so long, an OG like yourself, I would love to ask about your personal story with Bitcoin and the evolution up to now. How are you feeling about this whole phenomenon? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting story. So I found Bitcoin first in 2010. Uh, I was finishing a third year computer science course. You know, we were, we were working on a distributed systems class. One thing led to another. We found Bitcoins, didn't really know what it was started mining one thing led to another kind of last almost 10 years now i guess we've been working on a variety of businesses across the space um, watching every evolution and you know change uh, as it's come in front of us and watching adoption it's been an amazing ride uh, a lot of different avenues from exchange businesses to working with regulators to working on identity projects working with governments central banks you name it uh, we could go on for hours about it but uh, it's been an interesting time to see everything evolve that's for sure that's really really cool and what are some of the things that surprised you the most over this growth because when i look at your twitter account i see back in 2010 and you're referencing you know quite a, i mean it's not a long time but in crypto years as we say as the dog years that's a long long time what are some of the things that really you know marked your mind and and made you proud of being a part of this community I mean, like, I think that there's been a very big evolution and, you know, the, the early days were such an incredible time because it wasn't, you know, very financial based. It was really like a small group of people that were just interested in ideas and innovation and building. Um, and it was really just kind of like a unique experience, the early first three or four years. Um, but, you know, things change and things evolve. And um, and I'm, you know, I'm less of a maximalist in, in some ways, I think. Um, I'm more there to say, how do we solve problems? And what can we do to, you know, drive progress forward and, and freedom and security and privacy are, of course, incredibly important. But, you know, there's a reality to the world that we have to balance. And so, um, you know, I think seeing the rise and explosive growth across, you know, open source development in general in the space has been amazing. Watching the Ethereum kind of ecosystem and smart contracts and, and, you know, the new DeFi world that we're moving into start to flourish off the back of the early work we did. I find it interesting. Not all things are good. Not all things are bad. But, you know, that's that's the wild, wild west, I guess, in which the space has come from. Um, and so I know I, I'm I'm a bit more, you know, open than I think some others are. But, um, you know, there's good and bads and everything. But I'm just I, I love watching the progress. I think that's like the most important thing is that things are changing and, and we're changing the minds of people around the world. And that's, I think, the most important thing. 
that really is the most important and changing your mind as well despite having your own vision even if things change being able to adapt is not always super super easy i must say but i i have to ask you joseph like you know was it privacy first was that one of the core like principles in the early days with the cypherpunks were there any other things that really mattered to the people besides the whole privacy first thing like yeah so i think that there's this misconception that like it isn't always just about privacy. There's a, a division of Bitcoin that is very much about privacy, but Bitcoin is not inherently an anonymized system, yeah. right? And, and it gets really lost in translation. And there's different sects of, you know, the, the community uh, that have different beliefs. And that's completely, you know, awesome and, and normal. But like, it's not, it's not about making things anonymous to the core. It's about like, how do we build more transparency in the systems? That's my perspective, at least. Like, it's about how do you allow people to have more freedom and give them the ability to have a choice, an option. Um, whether that's more private, whether it's just your choice of privacy, that's, I think, the fundamental, most important thing. The reality is, is that the world is not only going to be in, in a totally anonymized system all the time. People have different, you know, trade-offs and the majority of the world is comfortable with a different, you know, um, type of system. And so um, I think the early days was much more about how do we ensure that that encryption is the, you know, the, the most important starting point. Um, and from there, you, you know, make the trade-offs. Companies are not always doing services privately with clients, and that's the reality. There's trade-offs in the system, but having a base system and a base layer that ensures privacy first to then opt out of that privacy is, I think, the most important piece of what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is a lot of things um, and many things to different people. And that's what I, I love about it so much. I'll always be a hardcore, you know, hard money advocate when it comes to Bitcoin and providing accessibility and openness is, I think, the, the mantra that Bitcoin is and, and it's doing its job in that. Um, but I do think that, you know, other infrastructure and innovations come and they solve different problems. And that's kind of what interests me across the board. Very fascinating and very, very well put as well. And as you mentioned, you know, Bitcoin kind of gave birth to many babies, you know, and I'd love to talk about these babies. You mentioned DeFi, but also recently we also have CBDCs becoming a very big, big topic. In terms of DeFi, I'd love to quote a specific topic that you know very, very well. And this comes from Crypto Slate. And the headline is saying basically that DeFi speculation and the main boom in DeFi in Q3 2020 are the DEXs. And uh, mm. what is very interesting, and as you know, is the volume traded on DEXs reached a point that, that was close to 20% of all traded volume, going from just a few million dollars to over $1 billion through Uniswap, mainly 90%. And on, in a single day. So how did you react to that phenomenon? How crazy is it? And do you see this as a sustainable measure as people, you know, they love the whole non-custodial, I don't need to do KYC, completely like more anarchist type lifestyle. What what, what was your impression of all that? Yeah, I mean, like, I just love the way that liquidity flows, right? Like it's less friction always makes things, you know, faster and more efficient, right? And that's, I don't think ever gonna change. Like that trend will continue to grow infrastructure around DEXs and this type of system, I think is going to flourish over the next few years. Uh, and I think it has its an amazing place in the world, right? Uh, centralization is good in some things, but it's also bad in other things, right? Whether you're looking at regulation, you know, we're starting to see a lot of changes. And, and like my view has always been like, you have to have optionality, right? Like there is not one thing that sets the entire world as a standard. People are more comfortable with different things. I think DEXs work for a very, very interesting set of use cases. Uh, the gatekeepers and exchanges are of course having to change the way that they operate and the way that they think as a result of this kind of open expansive uh, exchange infrastructure that's that's occurring across DEXs. I think there's a lot of problems. Scalability has always been an issue. You know, There's a lot of problems in liquidity and slippages and, and how you get those things right. Um, and if we can get them right, I'm sure this ecosystem can. Um, and I think it just provides a really good option to a certain set of people. Do I think that the majority of the world is going to run into a DEX? Maybe not in, in its first order. And, and I'm like kind of currently focused more on like, how do you allow the, the largest majority of the world to start getting access to digital assets and crypto? Uh, we kind of see that as the next place of real growth is like, how do you onboard the next 8 billion people? Um, and so I think that as these things evolve, you know, we, we need these options and, and, and opt in to a system like a DEX is an amazing option. And if you go to exchanges, it's also a great option. It really just depends on, you know, who your target audience is. So that's my view, at least. That's a great view indeed. And I'd love to ask you, Joseph, you know, how do you feel about this whole, like, I don't want to give my identity. I hate KYC. 
this whole uh, movement that is very anti-compliant in that sense. Like, what is your yeah. reaction to this type of behavior? Is it normal to you? Or yeah, it's a uh, it's it's one that like I think I've not battled with, but you know, so. I'm like very much a privacy advocate. And, and I think that like, you know, the core tenets of Bitcoin is what has, you know, driven me forward throughout my whole career at this point. I've grown up with Bitcoin in every waking minute of my adult life. Um, and, you know, I've watched it evolve. Right. And 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 I do think that, like, you know, we need something that has optionality and opt ins. And Bitcoin is an opt in system. Right. And, and you can opt into a free system that is very hard to do KYC. And I think that that's an incredibly important thing. Um, and I think that being able to give another option is also a really important thing because like today we don't really have many options. And, and when you eliminate the options, you eliminate the ability for new types of people to come in in whichever way they feel comfortable. I think the early crypto ecosystem is founded on this idea of privacy. Yeah. Um, and I think the problem is, is that like, and I noticed this many years ago is I'm sitting in the wild, wild west. We kind of helped birth the wild, wild west. But then I'm looking around and saying, in order for this to continue and to bring those, you know, the big next wave of, of adoption, we need compliance because the real world doesn't operate the way that we do. And so it doesn't, it's not meant to destroy the permissionless decentralized systems. It's, a, it's meant to give enough of a, a, a guardrail for the next wave to come into in a way that they feel more comfortable, right? And there'll always be this argument and always be this debate, but governments are not just gonna turn around and say, you know what, throw out the way we do things. It just doesn't work. So what I viewed to be the most important thing was how do the early guys in the space effectively impact policy, right? And so for the last three years, uh, I wrote the first digital asset regulations in the world. I largely helped found a lot of the uh, innovation and, and research was going on in the G7 and G20. We've been helping advise the Financial Action Task Force, but we're doing that because we're saying if people who know what they're talking about are not involved, well, then they're going to start building regulation that makes no sense. And it's, it's already at that point. And so we need more people to stand up and say, listen, we can help get you there without destroying the core tenets of what makes our ecosystem great. Um, and, and that's, I think, the battle that we have is, you know, there, the idea that we'll always work in anonymization is just not <laughs> realistic. And I don't want to kill what we have that's beautiful because of a false understanding of how things work. So that's my view on it. <laughs> uh, you just put it so, so well, Joseph. Seriously, like it was so easy to understand and it makes so much sense, the arguments to back that claim up. So is it safe to say that you do not believe that DEXs will completely overtake these centralized exchanges as these centralized exchanges may offer some of those things that you mentioned for people who are just not comfortable with that world? Yeah, that's 100% my view. Like, I think it'll be a very long time before you see financial institutions or the biggest funds on earth only using and utilizing DEXs, right? Like, you know, the way that like markets work, they work just and function better, at least today, in a centralized context. And to be honest, governments are having an easier time regulating that. And that's, you know, something that a lot of institutions from an insurance perspective, there's all these fundamental requirements that at least for the foreseeable future are much better equipped in a centralized function. And that's okay, right? Like, now, like not everything is always better decentralized. Functions of an exchange can be better in a decentralized format, but to say everything is completely decentralized, I think that's a far, a fairly far away future. So, uh, and that's okay. You know, you need centralized to get the first, your first Bitcoin, you know, to trade on your first token, like, you know, and, and I think over time those change, but we have a lot of technology problems we need to address before I think it's, you know, at that point. So that's my view. I could be wrong, but haven't been too much so far. So. Makes so much sense. You know, like the best of both worlds, myself as well. I don't want to custody all of my Bitcoin. I want to have a custody where my funds are insured in case something happens, you know. Definitely, yeah. And so Joseph, I want to ask you, obviously, so we talked about how Bitcoin gave birth to an entire token ecosystem, you know, gave birth to DeFi, but also CBDCs. And that seems to yes. be something that you're following very carefully. I look at your Twitter feed. Uh, what is your angle on that? Is that is that a good thing that Bitcoin was able to kind of move governments to follow this idea of blockchain and cryptocurrency for their own sovereign money? Is, is How do you see this? Uh, I have a bit of a mixed feeling personally about this. Insofar as I think we just kind of created our own monster in some capacities and uh, it, the next three to five years will be very important 
uh, as to whether or not policymakers truly listen to the advice and what is working and not working in the crypto space, right? There is a lot of places for error, right? And Bitcoin works or Ethereum works the way they do for very particular reasons. Like the structure of those systems work for a reason. Do CBDCs work in the designs that they're, they're, they're approaching? I maybe, maybe not. And I think that's where the risks start to come off. Ultimately, they have to fight fire with fire. And I think some of them are starting to realize that. Um, and so like the privacy side is what I think scares me the most from a surveillance perspective and everything else. Um, but I, I'm confident that, you know, our ecosystem will just move so much faster than that space that I think they will, t you know, play catch up and learn from the mistakes that we've created. Um, and I think that does give me hope for the future. Uh, it definitely creates accessibility and openness that we've never seen before, changes the way that monetary and fiscal policy function as a format. I think that's really interesting. Um, I think that permissionless innovation just runs faster and it's more interesting. Um, but my, if I can do anything right now, it's to make sure that policymakers have a good understanding and education around why to do things and why not to, and the unintended consequences of doing things inappropriately. So that's where my like area of interest is, but it's still early days. We have a long time and I think our ecosystem is a lot more fun before we see any like real implementations that, that affect our lives on that side. So. That's super cool. And you're right. You know, like governments are always behind tech companies, right? They're always, it's like a, a, a cat and mouse type race, you know, where they're, they're never able to, to catch uh, the actual person. So yeah, that's exactly. A, that's a really good point. Are you worried a little bit about the US dollar with the arrival of digital yuan? And do you think this could be a threat to, to the US in terms of, you know, being the, the global reserve currency? Yeah, I actually very much. Um, I don't know if it's so much the yuan. I think the yuan is, uh, you know, a shot in that direction. I think the wider picture play is where does the US dollar maintain its its control when you have tens if not hundreds of central banks and different types of currencies right like we rely and i think it's also important to like most people don't realize this but to maintain the u.s global reserve or any reserve asset is a huge job like in my view china does not want to take on that much responsibility and most people don't realize what goes into maintaining the stability that it does the u.s puts in tremendous amount of coordination ensuring that works and of course has its advantages but i think that there's like a bit of uh, misunderstanding and how complex that function is, right? And so I think the bigger question is when you have uh, thousands of currencies, how does the US stand out in that argument? And that's more where I think, you know, it's to be seen. But if they don't start, you know, figuring it out quickly, which I think now they're starting to realize this isn't going away, um, you know, they're in for a, a wild ride, which I think is going to be the case no matter what happens and how fast they move. So it'll be interesting to see. That's very well put in. Joseph, I have to ask you this question. Sorry, I know we had our own agenda, but you're giving me so many ideas as you're speaking. Yeah, of course. And uh, especially for you who has such a close relationship with policymakers and you understand governments, you're trying to help them, you know, move forward and stuff like that. Like, mm -hmm. how far are we from having an updated Howey test? You know, with the U.S., almost everything is considered a security uh, it's been there for, I don't know, 30, 40 years, I believe, so far, and, and may need an update with this whole token ecosystem. Will we have this one day where we'll have more freedom in the U.S. for the token economy? Uh, yeah, I think the U.S. is in between a rock and a hard place, right? And and there's a lot of internal dynamics that goes on in the policy side, right? And I would love for that to be the case. Do I think so? Mm, probably not in any time soon as it pertains to the U.S., Unfortunately, I think Hester Pierce has done an amazing job in trying to, you know, overhaul the SEC's like way of thinking. Um, and I mean, in all honesty, some securities law in some capacities is the right approach. And, you know, there's tokens that make sense and some maybe that do less. And so there's always that balance. My interest has been more so in countries that I think take a very innovative and open minded approach to this. And I just think fundamentally that Western societies are facing a tougher time. There's a lot more complexity. They have infrastructure already. When you look into, you know, developing nations or different places, you kind of can see them with a cleaner slate. So they can really start innovating on these things at the policy level. Uh, I do think eventually everything will have to catch up, right? Um, uh, but it's just a matter of time. But so I hope, but mm, it'll take a bit of time in my, at the very least. That makes a lot of sense. Now, I'd love to ask you a little bit more about Shift Network. You guys have some really cool things in the pipeline, and I love the fact that you guys talk a lot about data, about digital ID. 
Um, and digital ID, I believe, you know, NFTs is one of the hot topics the, in the past few months. Mm -hmm. And digital IDs are probably the most important NFT of all. But could you let us a little more, let us know a little bit more about what you're building and, and why it matters? Yeah, absolutely. So we started Shift about three years ago. Uh, the reason why we had started Shift is we were doing a lot of work on the policy side. And we started to, you know, we would always have this, we were building, I was building exchanges before. We sold our exchange to Kraken in 2016. And we were continuously getting hit with these big problems. Banks won't bank us. Compliance is an unknown. The ability to move data just doesn't work effectively. And, and we kind of recognized that there, that you know, the philosophy and thesis was that if the ecosystem was going to do what we thought it would do, explode and continue to really gain momentum, that there would come this intersection when governments start saying, we have issues here. Either we kill it or we find an alternative that can mitigate the risks on behalf of the, the wider world. Um, and so we kind of looked at the problem and, uh, and, and we kind of said, OK, what is a system that would solve a few really important issues? The question around counterparties, the ability to discover your counterparty, if you're an exchange looking for another exchange, as an example, if you're a government that's looking to do data transactions or a, some sort of a transaction between a bank and itself, uh, a DAP to a DEX to a centralized exchange, you name it. So there's this, this constant uh, requirement between some sort of an entity, a user, and its ability to move data between those two counterparties. Um, and so what we kind of looked at was how do we solve this fundamental problem? And then where are the, the best applications for it, right? So we kind of looked at the problem and said like, okay, this problem exists in a ton of different systems and, and situations. How do we build something that makes and really kind of fits the, the mark for it? Um, what we didn't know at the time was that the travel rule and the financial action task force and, and global compliance regimes would hit the ecosystem so quick. Um, we had been advising them in an independent capacity and kind of really just got thrown this on, the, on our laps and said, you have a year to figure this out. And so as we were kind of working on other parts in the policy side and shift was being built, we were initially building it only for national identity systems and providing more consent and, 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 and uh, sovereignty around users and their ownership of data. And then we started realizing that this global compliance issue that, you know, exchanges, custodians, maybe wallets soon will face will be something that could actually cripple the ecosystem if you do not look at decentralized ways of solving data transmission and counterparty discovery. Um, and so... Um, it's an interesting situation. We've been working with the largest exchanges in the world on solving what's called the travel rule. The goal is to make it so that users have better privacy and control over their data and you're not centralizing just this big flow of inbound and outbound user information. How do you really enable a compliance system to work for users, maintain the security of exchanges, and also enable new types of identity as an offset to that? Um, and then that system is working on national identity systems as well as a way to maintain privacy and control at the user level, at the data level. Uh, and then that starts to expand into DeFi and, and really we're working on some really cool stuff on DeFi that we haven't announced yet. But uh, uh, really around like how do you allow for a compliance opt in function to enable new markets and new market creation? Uh, and how do you kind of keep the regulators from, you know, maybe regulating P2P? or DEXs out of existence, which we think is probably the next big worry for the ecosystem. So lots to unpack, but. <laughs> That's exactly the question I wanted to ask you, Joseph. It was like, yeah. I was worried about compliance, like you said, reaching a level with a, with a travel rule. And recently the UK just closed down every single crypto derivatives platform. Yeah. And it seems like this could be a threat for the DEXs. Um, is, is that a worry? So you just mentioned, obviously it's a worry, but how worried, how, how worried can we be for this type of progress and compliance related to these things, the DeFi things? I would say very worried at this point. Like I, I'll be, I'll, let me be an optimist. So I think we can solve the problems that they have. I think what we have been learning from the travel rule for the exchanges was a very big lesson. In 2013 and 14, we thought we were, you know, untouchable and everything else. And we quickly learned in the last year and a half that you know, governments can exercise changes to the way our ecosystem works. Uh, and that's a scary process. And, and the exchanges today are feeling the impacts of not collaborating and having a strategy as our ecosystem. And that's a big problem. And so what we're looking at today is saying, how do we not wait until regulation catches up and starts impacting DEXs, DAPs, DeFi, lending, you name it. And how do we start implying infrastructure 
that gives regulators an understanding, say, listen, regulators, do not regulate this in the wrong way. We have infrastructure that can support it and you can opt into it. It is not forced, but at least gives us options to block or hedge the incoming risks that DEXs Dex, and P2P transfers have. Because in our view, it's probably within the next year, they're already talking to us about it. They're asking us how they would go about regulating these types of things. And that's a very scary world because it, it that fundamentally changes the way that everything works and it pushes us into the dark. Uh, and we can have crypto move to the dark because that just becomes a worse beast than the one we have today. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It does sound super scary, but hopefully, you know, your solutions will help, you know, uh, comply with the people so that they don't get shut down and they don't, don't, don't just end up going there and shutting the door all of a sudden. But uh, I would love to hear yeah. one more thing about the, the shift network. So you guys are managing uh, digital identity as well. Is, is this something that um, because, you know, these days, all I'm thinking about is uh, you know, Donald Trump complaining about how people might rig votes, right? And I just want to send right. him a message and say, you know, you can put that on the blockchain, by the way. Uh, and obviously, digital identity yeah. is also something that really hopefully we'll see on the blockchain as well one day that, that help us manage data much better. But wh what would mm -hmm. you like to see in terms of the future of data on in terms of the progress that can help, you know, our just everyday lives? Um, it's an interesting and I don't think it's any one thing like right like we look at identity in so many ways right the transactions I do on a on a dap can be a form of identity right my reputation uh, the, the the things that I do every day so we've been working on a few and we've been really focused on making sure the infrastructure that we build supports everywhere from a government national identity system an opt-in system for users that provides consent privacy and user control and visibility into the data that they hold as, as one extreme option let's say but then the other one is saying how does that translate back to decentralized protocols and how can you start to carry the the information and data that you have or utilize it in other types of things the idea being how do you allow identity and reputation to change the way that DeFi works from a collateral perspective? Uh, how do you change the way that credit works, the way that lending works by using the different attributes that make up who you are in an opt-in capacity? Um, and so we've kind of taken the approach of saying we're being forced into this regulation. How do we utilize the KYC requirements of the ecosystem on the centralized side to actually benefit users when it comes to compliant DeFi systems, digital identity as a usage uh, kind of mechanism to enable different types of, of, of services. Uh, I ultimately think that it's not one identity. And, and what would scare me is that governments force any type of system like that on citizens. Um, but I ultimately think as long as we're building these systems on permissionless infrastructure, that you can kind of begin to see a world where opt-ins or these pathings occur, right? So I choose to go to the government up until I opt out of that government service, right? And being able to carry my identity with me is really a valuable thing to a lot of the world that doesn't have identity, right? So it's to be seen. There'll be probably darker places that'll be more scary to watch this, this kind of privacy and surveillance debate roll out. But I think there's a lot of benefits for the people that need it most in the world that, you know, traditionally don't have access to a lot of things. So uh, I'm excited for it. I think it's interesting. There's areas of caution and experimentation to occur. Uh, but I think we're starting to really see that take fold now. So. Man, that was such a fascinating discussion to see the world from the eye of someone working right next to the policymakers and creating a new perspective on how we can see the outcomes of DEXs and all these cool things. Don't forget, guys, to follow Joseph Weinberg, CEO and co-founder of Shift Network with a Y. Yeah. Anywhere else where we can find more about you, Joseph? Telegram, Google search. We're always around. You can reach out to us via email or whatever works best. All right, guys, you had it. We talked about the Bitcoin babies, not just the crypto asset class, but the CBDCs, the centralized exchanges, the decentralized exchanges, the obstacles that we have coming in 2021, NFTs, digital identity, and all this cool stuff. So if you like this episode, don't forget to like, subscribe, and blast that bell notification so you can get access to more of these timeless interviews. Thank you so much. And follow us and watch every Wednesday premiere at a PC near you. 8 o'clock GMT. Thank you so much and see you next week, guys.